One thing I will tell you about the Big Island, though, is there's a lot of uncertainty here. Even with this ministry, there's a certain amount of uncertainty. When you do church outside on the grounds, everything is kind of up for grabs. Uh, what, three weeks ago, I think, we had to call off church because it was raining and we had nowhere to go. So I won't tell you what we did instead, but um, nah, I should, I should answer that because that sounds bad, doesn't it? We did church at Denny's that day. So, uh, yeah, so we had fellowship instead of worship that day. Ugh. But uh, we try to come down here and have church as often as we possibly can. And thank God, I'm glad we're not in Hilo because it would be a lot more scattershot. Here in the Kona side, it's not very rainy often on a Sunday morning. So we are blessed to very seldom have rainouts, and that's good. But I will tell you that when you live here on the island because people travel and there's sickness sometimes, you're not sure who's going to show up to set up or break down in our service. So that can be questionable. And then we store everything. These folks have been so gracious to us for almost 30 years to, to keep our, our um, all of our equipment here at the Kona Coast Shopping Village, or I said the Kona End Shopping Village, and uh, to use this facil- this ground out here free of charge. They've been very, very, very uh, loving to us over the years. And so, but we store everything upstairs, and sometimes the elevator can be a little questionable. Even this morning, we had a very nice man named Skyler who came and reset the breaker so that we could use the elevator. I got stuck in it a few weeks ago. So there are some uncertainties with doing church on the grounds. And that kind of even translates into the Big Island, quite frankly. When you live in a place that has earthquakes, those of you from California know about that, and volcanoes, and hurricanes and floods don't leave please i don't work for the tourism bureau can you tell uh but but we have a lot of uncertainties here even to the point that when you get everything essentially by ship or plane it can be a bit questionable at times i'm not a big union guy but i can tell you what whatever they're paying the longshoremen and whatever the longshoremen ask for over in california pay them give it to them because when they stop working we stop eating and so uh, we basically have enough to supply us for about seven days. And so when it gets shut off, it gets scary here in a real hurry. And so what we've learned here, and this is one of those principles I had to learn, Christine and I, when we moved here. If you see it on the shelf, buy it. Because it may not be there. And I don't care whether you're talking about grout or relish or tires. If it's there, get it. Because it may not be the next week. And so... But all that being said, I love living here. And we just learn how to deal with the bumps in the road along the ways. But even if you're not from Hawaii, I I dare say you have uncertainties in your life. Just because that's the human condition. But this morning I want to share with you a sermon entitled, Three Certainties. There are some definites in the Word of God that we can grab onto. And I'm going to take you to an interesting passage for this morning. If you have your Bibles, I'd ask you to turn with me to the second chapter of Luke. And you said, wait a minute, that's where the, 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 the account of Jesus' birth is. Yes, it is. But the next section is what I want to focus on. So if you would turn with me to Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 38. And just to give you a run-up to this, this would have taken place about... 40 days after Jesus' birth. And if you're looking on your calendar, we're about there. And so if you will, we're kind of planting down time-wise where we would have been distanced from the uh, Christmas narrative. So there you go. Luke chapter 2. Let me read this this passage to you. Then we're going to go back and we're going to look at those three certainties that I've already talked about. And when eight days were completed... Actually, I'm going to start in verse 21. When eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, this is Mary, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. 
And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at these things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will also pierce through your own soul, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with the husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years, who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke to him, of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. It's not a passage we spend a lot of time on. We do that first part of Luke and then we jump on. I've certainly preached that next section which talks about Jesus as a 12-year-old boy in the temple. But this one sometimes gets skipped over. In fact, I dare say we probably skip over a lot of passages of Scripture and and uh, I'd encourage you in 2020, maybe slow down on some of those and take some time because it's sometimes in those little sentences we skip over that there is great blessing. I discovered one of those this week in the book of John and I was like, Lord, what's this all about? And I had to go scratch around in my commentaries and was really blessed by almost like a connective type verse. But in this passage, these three certainties just jump off the page, folks. Here's the first one. I hope you believe this. God is in control. God is in control. As you look at this passage, you see that this, the, the, the key to all of this is timing. Timing. God orchestrates all that happens in these verses of Scripture, which is really, folks, how He runs the universe. I hope you believe that. That God literally is in control of everything that happens in this world. And if you don't if you'll forgive me for this, I'd like to kind of break it down this way. I see God is operating both in the macro, the big things, and also operating in the micro, the little. If I can put it another way, the macro being how the world runs versus micro, how you and I run. Let's think about it this way. In the macro, we see Mary and Joseph are operating under the directives of the law. The reason they were in the temple this day was because the law dictated that they be in the temple this day. It's what God had, 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 had commanded Israel way back in Moses' day. And Mary and Joseph, as obedient Jewish people, were in the temple because that's where they were supposed to be by the law. Did God know that when he gave the law to Moses? 1,500 some odd years earlier? Absolutely he did. But <clears throat> use that as an illustration of the reality that God controls literally the largest and the smallest aspects of creation. Think about the macro level. Think about something as simple as genetics. I believe that the things that we tend to do in our lives are greatly determined by how we were designed, how we were built, how we were made. It's been said that people come to Jesus Christ in one of three ways. Intellect, emotion, or will. That's, that's basically the makeup of human beings. Some people come to Jesus because they understand it intellectually, that they are sinners destined for hell and need a salvation, need a savior in order to be able to have a relationship with God. They understand it intellectually. There's other people that come to Jesus because they are broken hearted because of their sin. That's emotion. And yet there are others, and I think I fall into this category that say, you know, I have got to turn my life over to him because I am not getting it done my way. In other words, they surrender their will to him. Intellect, emotion, and will. And that's why some people, when they come to salvation, they're weeping and laughing all at the same time, and others are just as straight as a board. And you go, what's wrong with that guy? Just different. Different how we respond. 
And so you see, and all of life is that way, is it not? That's why, that's why some people are, are very analytical. That's why some people are, are just, just out there kind of living by the seat of their pants. There's other people that are, that are outgoing and, and, and just have never met a stranger and other people that would rather be by themselves at their house. Please leave me alone. I never need to see another person again a day in my life. Right? And maybe some of you are like that. The introverts I don't get because I'm certainly not that person. And, uh, you know, they, they tell me, well, you know, after I've been around a lot of people, I need to go home and just, just decompress for a while. I'm thinking, I'm energized. But you see, God built us a certain way. And so he uses that in our lives to, to get us to go where we need to go. I think we really are designed to be a certain way with God. On the other hand, we, we go to the, the very far end of this, is that God is in control of human history. Paul talks about that in his, his message on, on Mars Hill, and there's other places in Scripture where they see that. Um, why is it that at this very moment in America's history, we have the leaders that we have, whether you like them or not? That, that's God's will. Right? And I, I know I, I pray, Lord, bless our leaders, protect our leaders, and Lord, protect us from our leaders. I know I pray that a lot. Maybe you do too. Uh, but I have to recognize the fact that the, the king's heart is in God's hand. That's what scripture says. And it doesn't say only the good king's heart is in God's hand. It says the king's heart is in God's hand. And if you don't quite catch on to that, just realize that when that was written, that the writer was under the auspices of a dictatorship, essentially. And so, you think about how Christianity rose in the midst of a corrupt dictatorship known as the Roman Empire, right? And so, we, we sometimes kind of lose track of that reality that, that God's not just blessing and leading the good, guy, the good guys. He's also in charge of the bad guys as well. But what about the micro level? Look at, look at Simeon and Anna. It says that Simeon was led by the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit said, Simeon, I need you to be at the temple today. Anna, it says she was coming in that instant. And so instead of it being about the, the big machinations that were going on, he was speaking directly into their hearts to get them to the place that day. And ladies and gentlemen, I think any of you who are followers of Jesus Christ would admit that there are times that the Lord speaks to your heart to do or to not do certain things. To talk to that person, to do this task, to go to that place, whatever it may be. God speaks to our hearts through the Holy Spirit, through the, Holy, through the words of Scripture, maybe through another follower of Jesus Christ. You're in prayer. Anybody ever had that happen? You're praying and it just becomes impressed upon you. I need to do something, right? Whether it's pray for somebody or go and serve them or whatever it is. That's the Holy Spirit speaking into your heart. He does that. Consider uh, just a couple of examples from the book of Acts. Peter was led by a vision to go and to minister to a man named Cornelius and his family. It was the start of the ministry to the Gentile world. We'll talk more about the Gentiles in a few minutes. That was the start of that. Or Paul. I mentioned Paul earlier. Paul and his guys were roaming across uh, what is now the nation of Turkey, and they, they couldn't go to the north, they couldn't go to the south, and they just kept walking, and eventually they ran into the sea. And that night, in a dream, in a vision, he got the Macedonian call. God saying, come to Europe. First time that they'd ever moved the Christian ministry from Asia to Europe. God spoke directly to Paul and took him to that place. He can do the same for you and me. Is it going to be to start a, 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 a ministry in a whole new continent? Maybe not. But it may be to start a ministry next door. Or to do something different in your life. And so we need to recognize that God is always in control. And I hope that that will lead you to pray that way. Because if you recognize that He is leading, that means He has sovereignty over those circumstances. Is He always going to change everything to make it perfect for you and me? Well, I can say from definite experience, no, He's not. But He may lead us through those circumstances. Matter of fact, I know He will lead us through the circumstances. And as you pray, you're going to start to more fully understand what it is He's trying to do with your life and those of those around you. Second of all, the second certainty is this. God rewards faithfulness. Can I get an amen on that? Do you believe that? God re rewards faithfulness. We see it all through the pages of Scripture. 
Think about Mary and Joseph. Now, yes, they were led here to, to, to do what they needed to do by the law. But the reason they'd gotten to this point is when the angel Gabriel came to them and he said, folks, you're going to have a baby and he's going to be the savior of the world. They did what he told them to do. Especially when I think about Joseph, right? Mary was kind of in that circumstance where she was going to have the baby because back then they didn't do what people do today. And so, but Joseph was told, don't put this woman aside, marry her, make her your wife, take her and become the, become the father to this child that's going to be the savior of the world. They were faithful to do what God had said every step along the way. And so they were here because of that. They were blessed though, because of that, they were blessed by the words of these two strangers. Maybe they were still wondering, man, is this going to all work out? And then these two people came up and said, you're exactly where you need to be right now. The Lord is going to bless you. Is it going to be perfect? No, but he's going to bless you through this. Think about Simeon and Anna themselves. They have been faithfully following God for who knows how long. Anna, it says that she's, she's 84. Some people say she's 84 years old. Some people say she'd been a widow for 84 years. Either way, she was, she'd been around a while no matter how you slice that. But the fact is that she had been faithful for years and years and years. And Simeon, we really don't know how old he was, but it says that he had been waiting for the Lord. And there, there are so many instances in Scripture where those who are faithful are rewarded by God. Just think about a few Old Testament folks. Noah, the crazy guy building the boat out on dry land. And yet, who was it that was saved? And his family. Abraham and Sarah, they were promised. They, they, they were old when God promised them that they would have, child, to have a child, a child of promise. And they waited faithfully for 25 years. I've said this so many times. I have a hard time waiting 25 minutes sometime. And you, you, would, you would too, if you want to be honest with it. Sometimes we say, Lord, do it today, please. I need it today. 25 years. But God was faithful to give the child of promise. How about, how about Joseph? Joseph went through some stuff, but he was faithful to God even as he was imprisoned and a slave and all of that. And he ultimately became a leader, a great leader in the nation of Egypt. Daniel had the same thing happen in his life. Or how about Joshua and Caleb? All the other spies said, we can't take the land. We're like grasshoppers compared to them. We got to hightail it out of here. Let's not go into the promised land. And they said, we can do it. We can do it today. Let's go. Our God is greater than any enemy we might have. And God gave them the reward of faithfulness. And they, as old men, were able to go into the land. I love Caleb, by the way. Lord, give me that mountain. He was 85 years old. And he was ready to charge the mountain for God because he had seen that God was was faithful to those who are faithful. He rewards that. What's the third certainty? Not just that God is in control. Not just that God rewards faithfulness. But folks, what we see in this passage is, 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 is the core of what we need to recognize today. Jesus' salvation is for everyone. Is for everyone. In this case, in this passage, I don't think it's an accident at all that God spoke through Simeon and Anna, a man and a woman. Ladies, you were second-class citizens back then in that society and still in a lot of societies today, but not so with Jesus. Simeon also makes it clear that Jesus came for both Jew and Gentile. Did you see that there? Let me read that little passage again. He says, A light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Now my Bible, my, 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 this version of this Bible, um, in the Old Testament, every time that there's a promise of Jesus, they put a little star, an open-ended star, just an outline of a star next to it, saying this is a prophecy of Jesus. And over in the New Testament, when those prophecies are fulfilled, it puts a star next to it, but it darkens it in. And I notice it right next to that passage. A light to bring revelation to the Gentiles in my Bible is a dark star next to that. That's an answer to prophecy is what's going on there. If you're not Jewish, you're a Gentile, right? You guys got that? You're either Jewish or a Gentile. That's, that's one dividing line. We... You know, in our, in our world today, don't we divide so many different ways? We keep talking about we're trying to take, tear down the barriers, but it seems like we're making more instead of less. I don't know, just my observation on that. But here's what Colossians 3.11 says about it. In Jesus, there is neither Greek nor Jew, 
circumcised nor uncircumcised, that's Jew or Gentile. Barbarian. Any barbarians here today? <laughs> According to Romans, we'd all be, quite frankly. The barbarians were non-Romans. They were the ones, the barbarians at the gates, right? The Goths and the Visigoths and all the Germanic people. Yeah, those are the barbarians. Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. I don't know if you know Scythian. The Scythians were, and I don't mean to be unkind, but anybody, any Scythians here today? Am I going to offend anybody? Okay. Scythians were the bottom of the barrel. The Scythians were the poorest of the poor, of the uneducated. And every society has that, right? And we're not going to get into to that today here, but every society has somebody that's the bottom of the pecking order, the caste system. We, we, we don't talk about caste systems in America, but, but a lot of societies have them, a lot of cultures, a lot of towns and areas have them where, you know, who's on the top and kind of all the way down, right? I could explain that out here, but we, again, we're not going to get into that today. But it doesn't matter what other people think of you. If you're on the bottom, you're no different than the guy who's quote-unquote on the top with Jesus Christ. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Remember that? We were just talking about that at Bible study on Wednesday night, about, you know, the, that the Lord, the Lord called the poor because the rich didn't think they needed him. The poor would actually take the offer of salvation. The poor said, no, I got it. I'm good. He uses the foolish of our society to confound the wise is what Scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And so it doesn't really matter. If you're in Jesus, you're on an equal footing with everybody else that's in Jesus. That's an amazing reality. And that shook the ancient world up, ladies and gentlemen, because that wasn't working so good for people. Wait a minute. I'm the slave owner. You're the slave. I'm above you. Until you walked into church and all of a sudden your slave was teaching Sunday school. And you're in his class. That's what was going on. That's why the Corinthian church was such a mess, folks. That's part of why. The church had some really big growing pains. You know, we, we talk in churches today, we, we struggle over things like music and carpet and hymnals and Bible translations and all kinds of silly things. We don't fight over the carpet, do we? Not a bit. We like our carpet. But um, the early church had struggles that would have torn a modern church apart. What was the difference? This is, this is not in the sermon. What was the difference? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was leading in great strength and might. I think sometimes today we say, Holy Spirit, we'll, we'll deal with this one. We'll get back with you. If we were led by the Holy Spirit, there'd be a lot less struggle in our churches today. I'm so thankful that this church that meets out on this grass under these tents doesn't really struggle with a lot of that stuff. You know? I guess the Lord just saw fit to make us get along. We do a pretty good job of that, I guess. Don't chuckle, people. Folks, the reason that Jesus can save anybody is because He gave His life for us. That's why He can do it. That's what Simeon is talking about in verse 34. Did you guys see that? That, that kind of jumps out. It's actually in, in, in parentheses there where he says a sword will also pier a sword will pierce through your own soul also his mother mary some 30 odd years later would stand at a cross and see her son crucified her son who had never sinned not one time her son who had been the model child her son who she had watched minister in israel for 3 plus years who had put up with so much intrigue, who had put up with so many threats, who had put up with so many struggles, had never sinned, no, not once. He was perfect. And not just in a mother's eyes. Because more importantly, he was perfect in his father's eyes. Sinless perfection. Scripture tells us that the wages of sin is death. Because we are sinners, the reward for that at the end of our lives is death. Not just breathing no more, but separation from God for an eternity in hell. But Jesus didn't deserve to die because He had never sinned. But He took that sin of yours and mine and theirs the world wide over for all time upon Himself on the cross and died a sinner's death to save you and me. 
from our sin. But you're going to have to choose whether you believe that or not. And not just believe the facts, but believe in Him or not. That's what he was talking about, where he talks about the falling and rising. I know it's been a while since I read that. Did you see that? He is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel for a sign which will be spoken against. And he said that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Every single human being has to make the choice of whether they will accept Jesus and what he did on the cross. And the fact that three days later, because he was perfectly, he perfectly performed his mission, he rose again. That third day and never died again. Every single one of us must make that choice in our lives. And not to make that choice is to make that choice. Now, of course, God knows every heart, even when we may not fully know our own. But it's not about silently saying, yeah, I, I get that. It says in Scripture that you must, con you must confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead. That means that you are willing to say openly, I believe that Jesus died for me on the cross and rose again the third day. And to believe in your heart means, remember we talked about intellect, emotion, and will earlier? To believe in your heart means that you change who you are. You repent of your sin and what you've done in the past and you turn to Jesus. To believe in your heart means that there is a change in your life. Not just, yeah, 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 I got that. And maybe you get baptized. And maybe you become a member of a church. And maybe they give you a Bible, but your life continues on the way it did before. No, it means that there's a change in you from that day forward. And when you do that, it's a sign that Jesus has changed you from the inside out. You must decide whether you'll make Him your Lord or not. And by the way, if you have, this isn't one of the certainties. But it's certainly an encouragement as we start the second month of 2020. If that is a change in you, tell somebody. Tell somebody. You want to make 2020 better than 2019? Add somebody to the role of heaven through sharing Jesus Christ with them this year. I don't care how good your 2020 is going to be if the Lord tarries. It'll get better if you know somebody else is heading to heaven with you. It's been said we can take nothing to heaven with us except other people so folks the three certainties today let me just recap them number one god is in control if you've been spinning out of control maybe you just need to grab a little closer to god because he is in control it may not always feel like it but he is trust him that he is going to lead the day number two god rewards faithfulness you may not see the answer today, or tomorrow, or next week, or this year, or even this decade. But if you will stay faithful to God and believe Him at His Word, He will reward your faithfulness. That is a promise from the words of Scripture. Not from Bruce, from the words of Scripture. And thirdly, Jesus' salvation is for everyone. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, I don't care how bad you've messed up your life. It can all change today. People may have told you your whole life, unfairly, that you're not worthy. People may have told you that you're a loser. People may have told you that the world would be better off without you. Jesus came for you. You are precious in the eyes of God. And He's calling you today to be His. You can do that today. Folks, the uncertainty of the world will drive you a little nuts. Maybe a lot nuts some days. But there are certainties with God that you can hold on for your very life. Do that today. Can we bow our heads, please.